Hi, I'm Rachel Dillon, and together with my husband, Marcus Dillon, we lead Who's Really the Boss podcast, where we highlight the joys and challenges of running a business with your spouse or family. Our mission is to strengthen families and businesses by helping listeners avoid the mistakes we have made so they can lead and live happily ever after. Welcome back to another episode of Who's Really the Boss podcast. Hey, thanks for having me back. Yeah, we have just the two of us, but have previously recorded or will release episodes with guests who happen to be our team members. And so just feeling super honored and blessed by the people that we are surrounded by. Yeah, and I'm uh, thankful for them. I'm thankful for you that you're leading this conversation and it'll be a good one. Well, it is going to be a good one because the question is, why are you the way that you are? Yeah, and this is aimed at me, and then I'm <laughs> going to aim it back at you sometime in this conversation. Um, so why am I the way that I am, right? And I know that that's kind of said on different sitcoms and memes and things like, you know, when you're frustrated with somebody, like, why are you the way that you are? And all of our history leads us to, like, where we're at today. And we build upon the experiences and the life that we had, you know, previously to where we're at. So we'll kind of dive in a little bit into like why I think the way that I do, why I believe what I believe. And <laughs> why are you so driven? Why yeah. do you find it hard to stop and celebrate when you've achieved something and yeah. just always looking to what is the next thing? What is the next improvement? What is the next experiment? Um, what is the next vehicle? I mean, you just never know. You never know. So I think uh, this will also serve as like a precursor to therapy. So if I ever get a therapist, we can just hand them this as like, hey, this is what you should listen to so we can make the most of our time together on our first session. Pre-rec. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, native Texan, right? Which I know a lot of people celebrate that. Um, came from two blue collar parents, which uh, both of my parents didn't go to college. Uh, I think they had some college. My dad's actually a, um, he went to techn technical school. He's a um, diesel mechanic by trade. And then he actually owned uh, a business uh, during most of my sisters, you know, uh, so two older sisters, one's eight years older and one's 10, I believe. So I was the accident or the baby, uh, <laughs> was raised as an only child. Most of the time, uh, both parents, as mentioned, blue collar working. So latchkey kid, all that good stuff. Um, we were the first, uh, my sister and I to graduate college. I was the first to actually get a master's degree. She then, after me got a master's degree. So, um, but my dad owned uh, a trucking business in the eighties, seventies and eighties. And that's actually what brought that, the family from Florida to Fort Bend County, Texas, like Gulf coast area, Texas. And so it wasn't glamorous, uh, right. He owned a trucking business and went from, I think a handful of tractor and trailers to down to one when I remembered it the most, whenever he just had his single truck that he operated in, the, in a couple of different trailers. And uh, I don't know if it's a derogatory term, but um, what they're called is gravel buckets. So gravel buckets would go from gravel pits uh, in the outskirts of Houston and take gravel and, you know, different composites into new neighborhoods in Texas to build up the Gulf Coast, uh, which floods um, these new neighborhoods and put, you know, roadways in and different things like that. So he had different types of trailers that would allow for different types of gravel to do that. And if so if we're talking about we can't we can't just gloss over this. If we're talking about trucking vocabulary, <laughs> there's a lot we of good trucking. Go, we have to talk about a new vocabulary that I learned when I was introduced to your family, uh, which is lot lizard. So for any, for anyone listening who hasn't heard this term, would yeah. you share what a lot lizard is? So a lot lizard is a lady or, or maybe a man <laughs> who hangs out at a truck stop and is the oldest profession in the book. Um, you can, 
understand why they probably call them lizards, right? <laughs> and so, but you know, this is a very real thing. So if you hang out at truck stops late at night and you get a knock on the window of your 18 wheeler, it may be a lot lizard, uh, uh, lady of the night or some, somebody calling on you, I guess. So yeah, a lot of good vocabulary. And then another one that is much more common would be the truckers used radio communication and yeah. had a handle. And so, um, your dad's handle redbird and that came from his dad right his yeah so my his dad my grandfather owned a trucking business as well so i'm the first generation on my side not to own a trucking business right um so yeah i think it was kind of this family thing so maybe i could come up with a cool uh <laughs> handle or whatever but they they all communicate over cb and this was before the days of ways and apple maps and everything like that so they would communicate based on like traffic or Smokies, you know, like uh, police uh, speed traps and things like that, different things to watch out for uh, that they were trying to help one another, their, their trucking community. But better than your dad's handle, one of his very good friends handle was... Mattress Monkey. Mattress Monkey. Yeah. And I yeah. met Monkey yeah. um, and I'm like, why do they call him Monkey? And then whenever they told me his handle... <laughs> I didn't ask any yeah. more questions. The questions stopped there. After the lot lizards and mattress monkey, I just thought like, yeah. I need to quit while I'm ahead. Yeah. So the cool thing about the trucking community uh, growing up, and uh, I'll get back to that, but um, everybody goes by their handle, right? Like by their CB handle. And so my dad was Redbird to all of his friends and um, all of his friends, you know, it was just like, that was their community. That was their group. Uh, from, there was always a reason behind the handle. So like groundhog was another one of my parents' <laughs> friends and it was, he was born on groundhog's day. So like that was his given handle or, uh, and it's very similar to like military and pilots, you know, you go by your call, call signal and everything like that. So, um, but grew up, uh, in Fort Bend County, um, my parents moved here to because of the opportunity in the eighties with, uh, Texas, the booming economy of, uh, Houston and new neighborhoods going in and, uh, saw it as an opportunity to move their family here and do what they were doing in Florida. Right. And so I remember growing up, we had the, the business all the way up until I was about seven or eight. And then he actually, sold his last truck because the the economies in the 80s in Houston also were pretty tough. And so towards the end of that the decade, uh he sold his last truck because operating expenses got really high. He was you know not finding the different jobs that he wanted to, so he sold his only asset, right? And then he was probably unemployed or doing side jobs for a bit. I mean, I remember he worked for UPS for a Christmas season and that was crazy, like running, uh, just like you would imagine a UPS driver. And then he landed, um, at PepsiCo Frito-Lay, which is a great job. And he worked there for the rest of his career, retired with pension and all that good stuff. So, um, but my adolescent, like growing up, I remember, being in the cab of an 18 wheeler, like whenever I was sick or couldn't go to school and I would go from, you know, their house to the gravel yard to pick up a load. And then we would go into town and they would do that eight, 10 times a day, you know, and, and that was a full day. And if you were sick, you couldn't go to school. You would just hang out in the sleeper of the cab and be on the road all day, you know, and that was before cell phones. And so I don't know what I was doing back there, but I was having the <laughs> a blast not going to school. So, um, but we actually, it was interesting now looking back to see how he ran that business. And a lot of it was, he relied on himself, right? He was the driver. He was also the mechanic. He was also the guy fixing tarps on the weekend. So what happens in a lot of these businesses, if the truck's not running, it's getting worked on and getting improved so that it can be a little bit more bulletproof when it is running. So, and he always ran Peterbilt, um, as his tractor of choice. And those back in the day were probably close to a hundred thousand. They are way beyond a hundred thousand now. And the other thing that would happen is you customize your rig based on like your 
persona, your profile. So I, th I think those are the other pieces, probably why some of my style now is, is what I grew up with. I also grew up with two older sisters that would dress me up in whatever they wanted to. And I've been around a lot of lady, you know, uh, females in my life, you know, so it's like, uh, style was always important. Um, but that is probably why I gravitate to, um, engines and vehicles and style and why you drive, ma what you drive matters. And it kind of tells a lot about you as a person, but it was interesting growing up, you know, until about the age of seven or eight, um, you, even though you're not on the road, you're still working, you know? And I think my mom was the bookkeeper for the business and, you know, you're just, you're, it was a family affair. Right. And so I think all of that carried over into why, like, probably the chip on my shoulder in like why I've always had multiple jobs. Um, in high school, it started whenever, you know, as soon as I could drive, probably before I could drive, I started mowing yards, you know, and would mow yards for $30 a week, $40 a week, whatever that was, whatever I could get. And then all the way through college, I think I had multiple jobs. And then even probably wasn't allowed to do this, but even when I worked in public accounting in college, I always did work on the side, right? And so it was always ingrained in me that you had to have a fallback um, to not depend on any other person, right? So... Yeah. Um, I think that's very evident in a lot of the things that you do from when DBA started and wasn't called DBA. Yeah. When it was you and you were doing all of the aspects of the business yourself, which I think is where a lot of people start. So I think, you know, there's multiple ways that people come into business ownership. Um, a lot of the circles that we run in our second or third generation accounting firm owners that they have inherited, taken over, purchased from family. Um, then you have others that, you know, went out and purchased a business that was already there and others who start from scratch. And so lots of different ways, but our story is that we didn't, we didn't come from this line of work. No one that we know of in our immediate families anyway, are accountants, CPAs. Um, however, there was some entrepreneurial spirit there um, that has been yeah, definitely and, in your family. And even throughout you know, high school and college, I was very fortunate to go to work in a CPA firm, uh, took to that type of work and knew I could... Um, you know, do it. And there was an opportunity there. It'd be a good business. And I think that's what led me down the path of ultimately starting a CPA firm and growing, you know, that side of the business. So, um, but yeah, you know, you're a product of everything that you grew up with and are raised with, uh, whether you like it or not. Like, I think that's why you go to therapy is to unpack that and realize that that's why you believe what you believe or, you know, where you're at today. So, so all of my background, you know, the chip on my shoulder, always kind of looking out for self to a certain extent, not really relying on others and always looking for that next opportunity is what continues to drive me today. And, and we see differently, I see differently than others that were maybe raised differently, right? Like they grew up with a firm and they inherited a firm and their, their, how they've evolved their life and their business is different than ours. And I think that's okay. It's not right or wrong. It's, it is just different. And so where we've been able to connect best with, with clients and team members who are who understand, not always think like me, but understand why I think the way I do, right? And I think that's kind of why we're having this conversation today is because it is a little bit, everybody's unique to their own. And if you understand why that person thinks the way they do, it helps you understand the advice that they're giving. So there are people on our team, even my parents, whenever we said we were going to start the business or I was going to leave this firm and go to another firm, have always, you know, made comments or, you know, different pause or, or is this the right thing? And 
we've been very good to calculate risk and then move forward based on the calculated risk. And you have to real I have to realize that the risk tolerance that I have is completely different than the risk tolerance that somebody else on the team has, maybe what you have, what my parents had. And so that risk tolerance is built into all entrepreneurs. And I think entrepreneurs are a little bit more or, or less risk averse for the most part than somebody that just goes the corporate route and relies on the corporation or is totally, um, you know, just a part of the system, so to speak. And that, that all goes back to the advice that we give as we lead our own business and our own team to the advice we give to clients. Yeah. And I think that your experience of seeing that business, um, I I don't know how to say it, uh, nicer, (laughs) um, but kind of fizzle out, like kind of work its way down to nothing. Um, as far as your dad's trucking business has always, I think, kept that in your mind as motivation to not allow that to happen to any of your ventures, um, or businesses. And so really looking at that from when we were a tax heavy firm and we did most tax returns. Those are annual engagements. And while we do get an engagement letter signed for that year, it's only for that tax year. It's not saying that they're a client for life or even for the following year. So every year you really had the thought in the back of your mind of how many of those clients that we worked on last year are going to be clients again this year. So what did that motivate um, inside you as far as business or customer service? Always going above and beyond whenever you can. And I think because of the lack of recurring nature in those engagements, it also built in a lot of stress and anxiety that probably was unnecessary because the nature of the accounting business is, is very recurring annual to annual, like annual projects is still a very high likelihood, even if you don't talk to those people for 11 months, that they're going to come back. If you're still in business, they're going to come back. But if you have seen other businesses fail, if you know that you can't take that guarantee to the bank, you have to always drive and innovate and evolve to where, what does it look like to have a more stable, more secure business. And that's what we've always tried to build. That's what we've always tried to help clients identify as well, or friends um, that are in the industry is how do you build something that's more stable, secure, and ultimately worth more value wise? It, it, whenever succession does come into discussion, what does it look like to actually build something that is running with you or with you out, not a part of it? And the the thing there is we did acquire our first book of clients in 2011 and right now i'm listening to a lot of old school um advice uh so going back through through like jim rome and like some of the like guys that were the original influencers and the original <laughs> um personal development Yeah, personal development gurus of their day, Zig Ziglar, Jim Rohn, um, even Paul Harvey, right? You know, like just good, stable voices. They're the ones that taught the Tony Robbins of today or the... um, Ideas from James Clear and Atomic Habits. We were driving yesterday listening to Jim Rohn and you're like, how can James Clear use the concepts that he (laughs) does? And it's all the same ideas are just repackaged for the current, Mm -hmm. um, the current decade that we're in, I guess. So Jim Rome mentioned, you know, you buy something, you improve it, and then you sell it. Like that's capitalism Mm -hmm. at its pure form. And so that's what we did whenever we bought our first book of clients in 2011. And so we bought something, we improved it, and we have extracted value out of that original purchase, whether it's continuing to serve that client base, spinning off parts of that client base, different things like that. So if you believe in the capital market and you're going to participate in the capital market, that's what entrepreneurs do, right? And so that's the greatest opportunity uh, that we all have uh, in our society and in our country. So I think that's where 
that also has uniquely qualified me to the person I am. And you also see that America is a melting pot. And fortunately, you do have different cultures, different people coming into play and, and different uh, objectives and personalities and different insights. And so I think that's where the the great thing is how all those meld together to create something really unique. And whenever you look at a team, that's what's happening. And so what I've had to notice in myself, in clients, and where your risk tolerance whenever you first start out, um, and maybe you're just trying to make enough for yourself and your family, the risk tolerance there can be completely different than the risk tolerance you have when you have, say, 15 families in your care, 15 people that work for you and their families that work for you. So your risk tolerance has to change as the business grows. And if it doesn't, it could be bad for parties involved. And so a lot of times myself and team members, we're the sounding board and the caution flag for our entrepreneurial clients who are growing at a pace and their risk tolerance is not being adjusted based on the new level of responsibility that they have. So I think that's the other piece that as you grow a business and as you build upon the historical nature that has built you into the person, you also have to speak into that whenever you see it for others as well. Yeah. And so when we transitioned from that saw the need for transitioning from those annual only relationships to something that was more stable, something that was more recurring, that we felt like we could have a little bit more comfort in that those clients weren't going to just disappear or not come back. Um, we quickly realized that the value, the amount of service that we wanted to provide couldn't be provided with only you or with only you and one other team member that it was going to require if we wanted to help as many people as possible, if we wanted to help more people, then we also had to have a team behind us mm -hmm. um, that could help support that. Yeah. And part of that is when we started out offering those recurring engagements, our goal was just to get enough cash flow in to make one payroll. So it'd be one less thing that we had to worry about, right? That, okay, that, that payroll for the team was covered based on just this recurring engagement. And then it was, okay, let's cover payroll for the whole month. And then it was, let's cover payroll plus all of our fixed expenses, rent, utilities, all that good stuff to where we're at today, where a majority of our income now is recurring revenue. So that's how we built it. We built it small steps at a time, um, just to be able to cover those expenses we had. And, that's just been the evolution for us. And we didn't create a division within DBA. We we actually just evolved the business to be that because you learn from things throughout the the history of the business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I want to say that, you know, with our team, with your drive and your risk tolerance, our team is still top of mind. So for me, um, being your partner in crime, often your breaks as well as for your ideas that are coming up. Um, it's really thinking back to how does this add value or positively impact clients or team or both? Because for us, we could continue doing what we're doing for a pretty good while without making improvements, without changing, without adding on, without, you know, doing certain things. But when we take into account the people whose lives are being impacted, then that gives a little bit of context for, okay, or a little bit of motivation for, yes, let's continue pushing. Let's continue pursuing better rather than just becoming stagnant and staying where we're at. Yeah. So that was a great realization. Like you've always been there since we've had the business, obviously, because we bought it, we were already married. And the evolution of that to where we're at today is you were a sounding board, sometimes a break, sometimes you give me the green flag. Um, but then we also brought in a leadership team to also be that reasoning board, right? To say, hey, I've got an idea, like what are thoughts? How do we do this? And Marcus isn't the person responsible either. So if this is just a, a flyer and we're talking about it and it's going to go 
you know, not pursue it or if it's something like there's something here. And I think once other people that have made it to that leadership team hear that, that's the other piece where, you know, you and others that are in that meeting, they're also now sh- there's a shared risk tolerance in the business that is not all on the owner. And I think that's also been an evolution for us. It's great when we see clients do that, other firm owners, because they're able to bring their unique voice, their unique perspective to the team and what you've created there. So I think that's something that we've learned as well. I'm just now a voice in that room and my voice still carries a lot of weight. So I'm not, I try not to talk first, right? But having the other voices there and opinions and perspective helps guide the whole team, not just the business that we happen to own. Yeah. So we've talked about my background on why the way, why am I the way I am? And your background's different, right? And we came together, we were high school sweethearts. We've been together a long time, um, which that story and how we run our business and our family, you know, has unique perspectives compared to others. But tell a little bit about like your upbringing and why your risk tolerance is probably completely different than mine um, in, a well, di- in different aspects. Unlike you, I do utilize therapy services. Yeah. So we won't go, we won't go as deep maybe as what you shared. But the important thing to note here is so many things that I said in my probably teenage years, which I think we need to remember um, for our daughters, had to do with like, I'll never do that. I'll never be that. I, I see this. I don't like it. Or, you know, there's something about it. And maybe it was just stubbornness and like just being a teenager. Um, but I said I'd never move back to Houston and the first place I moved back to as an, as a young adult was Houston. I said that I didn't necessarily want to follow in the footsteps of my parents. However, my dad, my most of my life, um, he moved up into management, but he was a valve salesman in the oil field. And my mom is an administrator in a oil field company. So now I think we can safely say that somehow I have taken both parts of what my parents do. Um, my mom has recently retired, but taken what they did my entire growing up and adult years and put them together. And now I do both of those things. So maybe where I said, I'll never be my parents. (laughs) I have totally become my parents as my profession. Well, and so sales is something that you've been a part of both on and off in the business. And your sales conversations are more service oriented and how you can help people explain a little bit about why you approach sales the way you do, given your dad, I guess. Yeah, I think, and this is not to say anything negative, but because I was in that world, I could, I got to witness and experience firsthand people being sold, like, so doing things and saying things just to make a sale, having entire relationships around just making a sale. And that just felt too inauthentic, I guess we'll say for me. And so for me, it's really, and maybe this came out a little bit on other um, episodes that we've recorded, but that I really listen for the client and like, what is their pain point? What are they trying to solve for? And if we can solve it, obviously I lean into that and let them know here are the things we do and how this could help with that. If they're saying things that they're struggling with that we do not do um, or do not want to do, I am the first one to tell them, nope, we don't do that. We're not a good fit. And not to convince them that they need something different, not to convince them that what we do can maybe make their uh, problem better, but to give them a referral of who can fix that. So maybe a little bit of being behind the scenes of sales makes me not as trustworthy (laughs) sometimes. Well, and to be in the truck and on family trips and hearing one side of the conversation, you know, while the sale is going through and, uh, you know, 
you've only got the valve in your truck that you can sell that hopefully fits this application. So whatever we need to do to make it fit, right, right. is is where he was coming from or where he comes from. Look, yeah, and the great thing about that was his um, the company that he worked for, they could make whatever you needed. Yeah. And so that was the sale. Fabrication. Like, we can do, you need this? Okay, we can make it. You need this? We don't have it yet, but we can make it for you. Yeah. So I think that that's kind of where that fit in and Thankfully, I don't fall into that trap of like telling people, oh, you need that? Well, we don't do it yet, but we can. Yeah. Um, we don't. We Which really stick I, to <laughs> what we actually. Yeah, that's gotten me in trouble before <laughs> in this business. So uh, we may not do that yet, but we can. Uh, it was probably said in the early years. But I think that is answers a lot of the questions on why we're wired the way we are, why we have the risk tolerance we do individually and collectively, and why we see that as being important in our client businesses and our friends who run firms. And if you've never shared that background to the extent you feel comfortable, not not deep therapy where you're on the couch with your team around you, but it would help to for your team to know where you're coming from on some of those perspectives and why you are the way that you are, because maybe then they would have some grace to allow you to be the way that you are versus discounting your opinion or your risk tolerance, because it's so much different than their own. And that just goes back to relationships and you you're only allowed so many relationships in this lifetime. And I would just say, make the most of it and share that with others that you can. Yeah. Well, I think this was a fun conversation. I think, um, it's very enlightening to hear a little bit of your background and just kind of how the firm got started and why the firm operates the way that it does. So thanks for sharing. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks for hanging with us to the end of another episode. Leave us a review with your thoughts, comments, and feedback on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. Join us again next week for another great conversation.